So uh, welcome to this uh, Hong Kong stand at GCTAP 2021 session. Uh, on behalf of Hong Kong stand, we would like to thank GCTAP again for their kind invitation. Uh, we are glad, very glad to be here to share some of our knowledge. So I am uh, Dr. William C.K. Tan, and co-chairing the session with me will be Dr. Michael Kenyon Lee. So we have a number of very distinguished speakers and panelists. Uh, I would like to introduce them one by one. So we have Dr. Alan Chan from Hong Kong, Dr. Yoshifumi Kashima from Japan, Dr. Ho Lam from Hong Kong again, and Dr. Michael S. Lee from the United States, and Dr. Li Wa Tam from Hong Kong. So um, the, we have a very interesting title for today's session. This is about old and new weapons for our forever enemy, calcified nations. So as you know, nowadays we do have some uh, old devices, as well as some very new devices that are potentially very useful in treating coronary calcified lesion. So we love to, to explore each of them, and perhaps finally we can have a, um, a detailed discussion on which particular type of calcified lesion might be better for perhaps one or more of the, de the devices. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first Speaker. The first speaker is Dr. Kashima from Japan, from the Sapporo Cardiovascular Clinic. So the title of his presentation is My Most Frightening Rotation Case. So Dr. Kashima, please. Hello, I'm Kashima Yoshifumi from Japan. Now, first of all, I'm very honored to have an opportunity to share my presentation in this session. Thank you very much, Hong Kong and the Korean friends. I'm talking about the nightmare rotogration case, which you may have never seen it. I'm sorry, I have never had any nightmare rotogration case in my own procedure. Therefore, I cannot share you my miserable complication case of rotabration. Please offer me as a rotabration tamer next time. <laughs> it's a joke. I can't get any response on the web, so I'm hoping, I'm hoping everyone are laughing. Okay, however, I saw the worst rotabration complication case uh, as far as I know. One day, I witnessed the worst frightening rotation case caused by my colleague. I already shared that case at this session, Hong Kong stand in 2019. Do you remember that case? Okay, however, that was only the beginning of the nightmare. So today I share it. This case was late 50s May with an effort angina. He had severe calcified stenosis region on his proximal RCA, but very short, easy case. That PCI was performed by my colleague, who was an advanced rebel PCI operator. When the bar was moved to the platform, he didn't notice the wire flexing because he couldn't feel any resistances, he said. Therefore, just when the rotorator activated the wire rupture and the huge coronary perforation was happened. That bar had broken through the coronary artery and plunged into the myocardium like this. But this operator thought a simple coronary perforation happened. So he delivered a perfusion balloon to cover the perforation site. However, half of this balloon 
went to the myocardium. After that, he realized the bar had jumped into the myocardium. You can easily understand this fatal complication on figure four and five. While the hemodynamic state was stable, another guiding catheter and guide wire set in this RCA. And a covered stent was implanted on the perforation site. Since we needed to put on a stent at the perforation site first, we choose to press down the wire in place with a DES instead of retrieving the remaining wire. Therefore, after 5-0 cost dilatation for that covered stent, 3.5 and 3-0 DES were implanted on the distal side of the covered stent to press down the remaining rotor wire, like this. You can see on figure five, this bailout was completely succeeded as if nothing had happened. And this patient was discharged from our hospital a week later. I already shared and here in 19, uh, 2019 Hong Kong stand session. This is the final IBUS of this case. Yellow circle shows the remain the rotor wire. You can see the remain rotor wire completely pressed down by those stent. And those stent are position were very good. We made some schedule to follow up for this patient. There were no change the remain the wire position. Red line on CAG after eight months follow up. At 20 months follow up, the remained rotor wire looked a little bit out of place. This red line showed so, like this. However, we thought it to be a difference in CAG angle because of passing about two years. Then we judged no problem at 20 months follow-up. Nobody doubted this nightmare was over because of passing two years from the day happened miserable complication. Just after only a month, one month from 20 months follow up. So 21 months from the day happened in a complication, he hospitalized for acute heart failure caused by the acute massive aortic regurgitation. However, this patient never had a significant aortic regurgitation until then, and have only trivial one like this. Can you imagine what could have happened? You can clearly find the prolapsed dot wire on TEE image and CAG. Yellow circle, yellow arrow, and the red line shows the prolapsed rot wire on each figure. Little bit difficult to see it, but you can see the, this prolapsed rot wire like this. So the remained rot wire prolapsed out from RCA to his aortic valve. So we decided to do that surgical operation. So surgical procedure was performed for this situation. Please look at figure one. 
the remained rotor wire was big out of place and caused some massive aortic regurgitation. The major part of remained rotor wire protruded outside RCA and reached the aortic valve like this. Then this rotor wire cut and badly broke the aortic valve. Finally, our surgeon retrieved a 70 millimeter remained rotor wire from RCA and finally replaced aortic bar. So this is summary, right? When the PCI, if only this operator would have checked the rotor wire position, this nightmare complication was not happened. When the 20 months follow up, if only we would have slowly examined even small changes, this nightmare didn't last. So this is my take home message. The smallest careless mistake can be the beginning of a nightmare that will never be awakened. Countless heartbeats and vascular movements can move even a lateral foreign body in a coronary artery that should have made bail out with covering by stents even two years ago. I don't know if other coronary arteries will have similar complications. However, because the right coronary artery is subject to great movement due to heartbeat, respiration, and own vascular motion, care must be taken as in this case. We should be mindful that even small changes should be verified without overlooking them when follow up. Thank you for your attention. That's all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Kashima, for uh, uh, your excellent presentation. And thank you for joining our CICF 2019. <laughs> and uh, it's really nice to look at the follow up of this patient here. I, I just want to clarify the point. Now, do you think? The wire fragment has actually migrated backwards after 20 months, or is it the wire was actually hanging out into the aorta to start with? Just that uh, it was kind of uh, not noticed during the end of the procedure. So in other words, is it a real migration or the wire has been there all the time? What do you think? Yes. Uh, of course, and uh, we notice it a little bit outside, uh, out of the position, position of the outside uh, uh, with the rot of wire, remind the rot wire. However, two years, uh, two years uh, over the uh, two years period, it gives us the uh, safety, <laughs> safety. Mm -hmm. So we don't think Remaining rotor wire prolapsed into the aortic, uh, uh, our, uh, RCA to the aortic valve. So, um, of course, and uh, we should check it, uh, uh, another angle, CH angle. I think so. Mm. Because the wire is supposed to be uh, crushed or trapped under a few layers of eluting stems. So uh, I'm not sure, so sure if the wire can actually get migrated after two years, say. So, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, of course. And uh, uh, I think uh, I have uh, uh, about uh, 10 cases like the uh, similar situation. Of course, and uh, I pressed down the wire to for the bailout. However, almost all cases, excluding mm -hmm. this case, no problem mm. for after one year, two years later, three years later. Mm. However, only these cases happen. Mm. So I think in the RCA migration is a very hard compared with the left artery, coronary artery. Mm. So of course, I, I, I'm amazing <laughs> it. And Dr. Kashima, is this uh -huh. a rot rotor floppy wire? Yes, right, rotor floppy wire. Mm. 
Why? Um, it's a bit difficult to imagine a floppy wire because sometimes you might see guide wire all the time. Mm. A floppy wire, even it's around the aortic valve, it will actually damage the aortic valve because the wire should actually uh, flow around in the aortic valve together with the blood flow. So it's yeah, yeah. very difficult to like stay in one position to actually injure the, the aortic valve. It's a bit unusual, I would say. Yes, of course. And uh, if the tip affects to the aortic valve, uh, tip of the wire affects to the valve, of course, floppy wire is a very soft. So, uh, but it, uh, uh, this wire cut the mm. part of the shaft. Yes, so mm. shaft part is very hard. So mm. maybe it has happened that this complication. I think so. Mm -hmm. right. mm. yeah. I have an impression. Uh, it, I understand, um, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Kashimi, most of the case, if you gel the, uh, uh, the wire over there with the stand, it's okay because most of the time, um, the broken part of the wire probably will be elongated and remaining shaft of the gyra will be relatively floppy. But unlike this case, uh, it's Probably is the wire guy wire is broken by the uh, by the, by the uh, rotor blader, so it's a sharp cut Maybe and sharp. Uh, and yeah. the length is I think it's a perfect match, the length uh, the stiffness and then you will make the the, in, the prolonged injury to the aortic valve. Well, I don't know, mm. <laughs> probably is the, the very, very stiff part of the length. In case the short um, the, the the guy wire broken is more sh uh, shorter close to the osseum without protruding much, probably may not be a issue. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yes, uh, uh, one more short, short comment. Okay. Yes, uh, Dr. Kashima, I thank you for sharing this. But just uh, for the, I mean, uh, for the Julia. So for that case, for ordinary motor beta case, so do you think a guiding catheter, we need a supporting guiding catheter in order to prevent this complication, or you prefer uh, just a less of supporting, but more coaxial guiding catheter to be more beneficial or more safe in doing motor beta? Yes, but, uh, yes, but uh, in this case, is, I think in the type of the guiding catheter is not consigned because uh, the only uh, operator cannot know, uh, didn't notice the flexing the wire, protruded wire. Yes. So we needed to check it, uh, uh, our carelessness. So yes. <laughs> it is mm. important. Okay, I, thank you. I had uh, some uh, very small tips to share. Every time I start the water patient, before I start, I will slightly pull the wire, make sure the wire tips uh, move a little bit uh, and then start. Then that will be a very safe maneuver. Okay, I think we need to move on. Thank you, Dr. Kashima. Uh, thank the you next... so much. Okay. Thank you. The, the next presenter uh, will be Dr. Ho Lam. Uh, he's from Truman Hospital, Hong Kong, and he's going to talk to us uh, on the conventional as well as the non-conventional use of the intravascular lithotripsy. Dr. Lam, please. Oh, thank you, Dr. Lee. So this is my topic, conventional and non-conventional use of shortwave. So uh, maybe shortwave is a little bit new to some countries. So I will start with some simple case. This is a uh, conventional use. This patient uh, end stage renal failure, multiple medical problem, of course, have calcified the lesion. Uh, angiogram may not see clearly, but uh, from OCT you will see it uh, very clearly. Um, you can see some essential calcium tight lesion, and then wow, well, very very thick calcium. Yeah, circumferential, 36, 360 degrees. And the uh, calcium actually is very, very thick, more than one mm. And then with this case, we put the patient on short wave and do IVL, see what will happen. And this is the OCT after short wave. You can see that uh, this is a classic case. You can see lots of vessel dissection. It's very common. And then you see very, Fake calcium, but all were cracked, no matter 30, 360 degree or other, it was completely cracked. And then we put the patient on stand, uh, full expansion. Uh, there's another convention case. This is uh, outside CTO. Uh, you can see that uh, the long outside CTO and there's no stand. The patients uh, also anti failure heavily calcified the outside. And then we wire it. Of course, uh, two force, two force, and uh, 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 
uh, it, it looks beautiful in wire, but there must lots of damage, dissection, something. Now imagine in the old day, if you can just use uh, CSI, diamond bag or water basin, it's possible, but it's risky. You may introduce a very uh, rigorous uh, spiral dissection. However, if we have short wave, we just put the short wave and then short, 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 short and then put the stand. The result is like this, full expansion. So the conventional use of short wave actually is simple, direct, beautiful, but boring. Um, it do not require many techniques, even one year fellow can do. So let's go to see some non-conventional things. Uh, this is another outside CTO. We can see that it's uh, quite calcified. And uh, there with some uh, epicardial channel, uh, uh, initially, I don't believe I can wire from antiquate. Uh, the wire you can see go to a wrong track, some dissection, in, not in the true lumen. So I already prepared short guiding for uh, retrograde and try and probably need a few hours. But uh, for unknown reason, I'm not sure, <laughs> certainly the wire guide fee go to the true lumen by luck, and then uh, I'm very happy and excited, and then just pedalate more balloon and put the patient on stand. However, I, I did not do the preparation well on the possible outside, and then after standing, you see the stand do not open well. Even I use high pressure balloon, I inflate the pressure up to 26, uh, 20x, but the, but the stand still cannot be ex expanded. Uh, you can see that is the outcome. After standing, the stand do not expand and here. So in the old day, maybe you have to make yourself in risk because you have to do all the patients for newly implanted stand. But now I just put the patients on short wave short for a few times and oh, it was fully open. Uh, the only drawback is that the deliverability of short wave was very poor. Even this possible reason, I have to use a guide extension to help to deliver the short wave. And uh, I, maybe this is still too conventional. Let's go for something even more <laughs> non-conventional things. So there's another calcified lesion, calcified LCA. So, uh, this case, I you know, don't never try to use short wave first because it's impossible to deliver. I try water patient first, water bay for uh, 1.5 bar, water bay for five times, uh, repeated water patient. And then uh, I try to balloon, it seems okay, and then I go for standing. Uh, after water patient is uh, more easy to deliver things and deliver the stand and inflate the stand. And this time again, Seems that the expansion of stand was not well here. We can see uh, here, it do not expand well. So of course we try the short wave. I tried the short wave again, but it still do not expand well. Even after the short wave, it do not expand well. So we come up with a, this situation despite after water patient. After short wave, the stands still do not expand well. So in this sort of situation, what could you do? Uh, yes, I, I, yeah, that is the Sydney. And then I see here, it do not expand well. You can see this view can see more clearly here. It do not expand well. We know that if it do not expand well, uh, it will have ISR or send from process in the future. So. I try a new thing. This repeat short wave. That means I uh, use the short wave uh, for another times. I use uh, another new short wave to sort another uh, X cycle of short wave over the same uh, lesion. And uh, after that, the stand open. I think that may be the first case I use uh, double short wave uh, on uh, one lesion and then uh, show some improvement uh, after standing. Okay, and uh, that is my presentation. I, I have shown some uh, conventional and uh, classical short wave uh, case, and also uh, short wave on newly implanted stand, and also the repeated use of short wave on the same lesion. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Lam, for very nice cases, both conventional and non-conventional uh, use of the uh, intravascular lithotripsy. Mm. Uh, for, for, for your both uh, non-conventional cases, when you use shortwave balloon for a newly implanted stent, uh, my, my worry would be disruption of the polymer or the drugs. I, I suppose they are ODES. So I, I don't know if there's ev any evidence uh, for the acute use of shortwave in the setting of newly implanted stent. How, how will the polymer or the drugs behave in such uh, situation? Yeah, I think that is the main drawback. Uh, it's not a uh, routine use, not do it in a routine use. Uh, it's just a bad out. Uh, in my situation, I have no choice, then I, I do it. And uh, <laughs> I'm very unlucky we have met uh, many of these situations. We try to short the new lean panda stand for uh, many times, more than maybe around 10 cases, but all cases are well. Uh, so far, uh, none of the cases come back. Uh, so probably that is safe. Of course, there I must say that there is no evidence for that. That is non-conventional use. Do, do you have OPM balloon available in your lab? Yeah, yeah. The other yes. option would be to use an OPM balloon to try to open up at a higher pressure. Yes, that is uh, also another option. But we found that probably uh, OPM balloon, uh, the efficacy of OPM is less than short wave. And... Uh, uh, I used lots of OPM before for those ca uh, cases. Uh, we found that uh, there, there is a high risk of uh, balloon wire fusion, and which is quite troublesome. And that's why recently the OPM balloon, uh, they withdraw a little bit. They said their maximum pressure is 32 only, and do not allow 35 now. Uh, Lemho? Yes. Very, yes. Um, uh, very yeah. interesting. Yes. So I just want to ask for your second case. Why the first software balloon did not work, but the second one after your stand implanted the software work? Any uh, special explanation for that? Yeah, I think um, probably um, the first use of shortwave, they had some uh, intravascular lipotripsy broken some of the calcium. And then uh, with some improvement, and then I repeat with high pressure balloon first, and then uh, high pressure balloon, 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 and then pack all the calcium again, and then they will become very hard, very thick again, and very opposed to stand. And then I put the shortwave again and short and then that may uh, improve the uh, efficacy. And uh, another thing is I, I remember I used a uh, oversized uh, shortwave, uh, try to have a better opposition, and then um, sometimes may give better result. Uh, that is the two uh, tips and tricks. Uh, one is the use of mm. high balloon pack or the cracked thing, and then the second is use uh, upsize. Uh, Dr. Lam, in your last case, uh, so you, you did road ablation first, Yes, and then you put in stents, and then you find out that some of the stents are being underexpanded because of the calcium. I, I was wondering uh, whether after the initial rotation, if you would have to do some imaging, for example, OCT or IVIS, yeah. and you pick up uh, there were segments that have not been fully expanded. Uh, maybe you have some other options like um, upsizing your burr or change to OSA or use uh, upfront the the uh, IVL balloon, would it give a, a, a make the job easier instead of uh, dealing with an underexpanded stand? Yes, absolutely agree. Uh, that case is because we cannot deliver the intravasa imaging. Maybe with the new OCT cavita is possible, but at that time we don't have. Yeah, I see. So I, I, I guess one, one of the uh, good sign of uh, lesion being not uh, readily dilatable would be when you are not able to deliver even your IFAS or OCT catheter. That's right. So if you meet a lot, meet a lot of friction or resistance, then probably the lesion have not been fully uh, prepared. Perhaps. Yes. Any other um, yes. comments or questions from our? Yes, Alan. Yes, I have a, a brief comment. So. Uh, I guess the IVL is um, still new to uh, many regions, and I think uh, lots of possibilities still are ex exploring. So I, 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 I'm thinking uh, currently we don't know the limit 
or of the IVL, in particularly, uh, is it it can crack all the calcium? I think there may be certain mm. thickness of calcium that you may still have encounter difficulty. So I think one one device may not be fit all. Otherwise, uh, we will not have um, so called the, the subsequent talk. I will talk about the combination approach. So I think for usual usual piece of calcification that you can pass your shortwave balloon down, probably you can do the job. But for, I think the lamp whole case is the super calcified case. So it's really thick. Uh, despite uh, some abrasion modification techniques, you abrade some of the calcium, you still have a lot of remaining thick calcium that may have difficulty to be break by shockwave. So probably yeah, so in the future studies, uh, maybe the area, are there any cut-off you should think of extra option before you put in a shortwave? This part I, you can pass the balloon down. I, I absolutely agree with uh, Adam. Um, I, I, there's no paper to set a definite line, but I can say two things. is Don't have expectation of shortwave on first deliver, deliverability. <laughs> Second is efficacy on eccentric calcium. Yes. Okay, that's a good wrap up, Dr. Lam. Thank you. Let's move on. Okay, thank you again, Dr. Lam. So that really set a good platform for me to introduce the next speaker. Uh, so we are very honored to have Dr. Michael S. Lee from uh, UCLA School of Medicine, uh, United States of America. So he's going to talk about when and why OAS works better for calcified lesions. Uh, Dr. Lee, please. Dr. Chan, thank you so much for the kind invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure and honor to be part of the, the uh, Hong Kong session. So we all know that calcification of the coronary is, is a very difficult treatment. Um, I want to show you a case that I did about eight years ago and just kind of explain why I currently use oral atherectomy. This is a, a elderly female. You can see she has a, a severe uh, osteo left main, uh, osteo LAD, circumflex, uh, mid LAD, uh, calcium everywhere. So think about in terms of rotational atherectomy, you're, you're certainly not going to use a 175 or a 20 bird to start with, perhaps a 15, but if you look at the osteo LAD, it's very stenotic. So I thought for this case, you should start off with a 125. So 125, but 125 is not going to address the left main. So we went to 15 and 175. This required a, a seven French sheep. So after this, uh, the procedure was really straightforward. It required a crush of the left main and sent back to the Austin the left main. This is a uh, pot flaring of the left main. And here's your final angiographic result. So I think this highlights the shortcomings of rotational atherectomy in that a one size fits all, it doesn't really apply. You have three different burrs and it just takes time to swap out each burr, especially with a patient with healthy uh, dysfunction. Now, the reason why I use orbital atherectomy is the following. One size actually does fit all. Uh, you start with a one, two, five crown. And if you, um, just by hitting a button from low speed to high speed, you get what amounts to be similar to a 175 burr. The other potential benefit is that it has bi-directional sanding. So unlike, let's say, rotational atherectomy, where there's only atherectomy uh, when you go anti-grade, you get no atherectomy when you come proximal. There are case reports where the burr with a 125 in particular has gotten stuck and that can lead to a big ramifications and complications. The other benefit is the following. Once the rotational atherectomy burr crosses, it generally stays in the path of least resistance. So let's say here that's making contact at the greater curvature. But what about here? You're not really getting contact at the lesser curvature. Orbital atherectomy, not only does it rotate, it orbits. So it's at 360 degrees. So you'll get contact throughout the entire vessel. This actually provides a benefit in terms of perfusion. The fact that it orbits, it's not really going down the same path of least resistance. Henceforth, in theory, you should have persistent and consistent perfusion uh, throughout your atherectomy. So what sort of data do we have for oral atherectomy? Well, this was a seminal trial performed in the United States with 49 uh, centers in the United States. We have three-year follow-up. At three years, if you look at the target lesion revascularization, in heavily calcified vessels, 
7.8%. This is really phenomenal. So you think about all the heavily calcified patients with diabetes, long disease, uh, dialysis, 7.8 is really great. Those were in a clinical study. Now, this is a real-world study where we combine our data with St. Francis um, and other, another center in New York City. So 458 patients. What about safety? Phenomenal safety. Less than 1% risk of perforation, dissection, or no reflow. At 30 days, uh, MACE rates were acceptable, uh, predominantly due to myocardial infarction. At one year, MACE was 12%, predominantly driven by target lesion revascularization. So several examples of how orbital arthritis can be used. This is a patient with end-stage lung disease who needs a lung transplant. Cabbage is not an option for him because if you intubate, very difficult to extubate. So you have left vein disease at the distal bifurcation, osteo left vein or LAD, and diffuse LAD disease. So again, you're not going to start with a 175 burr. The other benefit with orbital as compared to rota is that if you use a 175 burr, you're going to need at least a seven French guy catheter. With orbital, you could perform left vein PCI with a six French shape and henceforth, you could actually even go radial, although in this case we did not. So we started out with a 125 birth going across, then to address the left vein, we went high speed, which again is similar to about a 175 birth without having to swap out. So very simple, very versatile. In fact, that you could perform atherectomy quickly, maybe two runs with low speed, one run with high speed, and at that point, you could provide definitive therapy. Uh, we sent it across and the far other circumflex is unremarkable. This was another complex patient. This patient had included right, uh, severe um, left vein LAD disease. Um, this patient had a cardiac arrest at, at an outpatient setting. So it was brought to our institution. Ejection fraction was about 30%. So the patient has, again, prox LAD, distal LAD disease as well. And Pella was placed for human event support. This is a again a one two five crown, low speed followed by high speed. After pre dilatation, the balloon fully expands. Then you start distally with a one two seven five stent, uh, optimally with a three two five, post dilate with a three five, and you, here's your final angiogram result. Patient did great. This is another situation where, again, orbital atherectomy really is very useful. This patient had severe PAD, so we could not use a mechanical circuitry support device. He had severe LV systolic dysfunction. He had a complex distal left main bifurcation, a long diffuse LAD. So this patient we decided to perform PCI because cabbage was not considered an option given his comorbidities. Star CA was easily addressed. Stenting. Then we addressed the left main because of the heavy calcium we decided to use orbital atherectomy uh, with the one, two, five burr. Excuse me, crown. So again, you can see that his CS severe PAD, just long diffuse uh, SFA disease. Uh, he also had uh, external iliac disease, so not a candidate because of his PAD. So here's the final angiographic result of the RCA. Uh, it's straightforward. We did this all in the same setting. So this is a orbital atherectomy crown where we did low speed in the LAD and for the left main, we use high speed. Because of the complex bifurcation disease, we decided to do a DK crush technique. So uh, pre dilatation with a 325 balloon followed by a 325 23 millimeter ever almost stent. This is pre dilatation with a circumflex. After stenting the osseo circumflex, uh, we put a 4 0 by 18 millimeter Everlum so we can sit in the left main. And here's your final angiographic result after kissing balloons. So I think this case again highlights the versatility of using orbital atherectomy, the fact that you don't have to swap out different size burrs. You could do this from a radial approach, so you decrease risk of vascular complications. Um, and the fact that you can maintain perfusion during these complex cases is very handy.
So failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for your uh, excellent presentation. Uh, do we have any burning questions for Dr. Lee? Uh, can, Dr. Can Kashima, oh, okay. please. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, thank you for your good uh, sharing the case from your experience, uh, Dr. Lee. So I have the OAS concept for the classified regions. However, the OS sometimes give us a good operation, but sometimes not. So recently I rarely use it because and I cannot predict the risk and the effect from CAG, IVAS, and OCT mm -hmm. at the pre procedure, unlike is a rotavator. So if you can do it, please tell me how to predict that. So just to be certain, your question is, how do you know if orbital atherectomy has performed? Risk prediction. Risk, pr risk, risk prediction. Clarify that. Risk prediction. How, how do you predict the risk of the procedure? Yeah. Risk prediction. Got it. The risk of a complication overall, if you look at data across uh, orbit to our data, um, the risk of perforation is quite low, less than 1%. Um, the ways to limit or decrease the risk of perforation is to avoid high speed, unless a vessel is, some people say 325. I tend to not go high speed unless it's 35. I would go more uh, low speed with more repetitive passes. Angles, uh, severe angulation, uh, tuosity, those are patients who are increased risk as well. Um, if it's an osteo lesion, you got to be very careful. Some techniques that you can do is to take the uh, crown distal with, let's say, glide assist, and then work your way backwards. So there are ways to minimize your risk of perforation and dissection. Slow flow, no reflow, the risk of that, in my experience, is low. Generally, that will occur in patients with long diffuse disease. So what I would say is as opposed to going backwards and forwards, I'll make one pass antegrade stop, give this patient a chance to breathe, and then just make passes back and up, forward stop, back up, and stop, uh, literal use of vasodilators. Um, so, uh, Dr. Lee, could you comment on the effectiveness of the optoarthrectomy in terms of the distribution of the calcium, for example, concentric, eccentric, or uh, calcified nodules? Very good question. I think that is one of the strengths of orbital atherectomy. Unlike rotablator, if you pass and cross a lesion, it will cross continuously in the path of least resistance. It won't try to cut through calcium again. It will just go through that same channel you, pr you provided. With orbital, every time you go backwards and forwards, you do, more you do more orbiting, and therefore, in theory, you have more 360 degree contact. With rotoblader, if you cross with the 125 burr, it'll continue to go down that same channel. And if you listen to the cadence of the atherectomy with orbital atherectomy, every time you go back and forth and you're actually ablating, you could actually hear the high pitch squeal. With rotational atherectomy, once you cross, you can go backwards and forwards and you won't really hear that you're continuing to atherectomize, which is unlike orbital, the more passes you go, you can still hear the times where you're continuing to do, to do uh, uh, atherectomy. Mm -hmm. Do you have any specific tricks, tips and tricks when you're faced with a calcified nodule? Um, I think just, so <clears throat> the technique, for example, with rotational atherectomy, I think the previous presentation where they went backwards and forwards, almost like a windshield wiper when they go very fast, you should never go fast with orbital atherectomy. You just go very slow and let the device, they say typically one millimeter per second. So it's a very gentle uh, advancing of the, of the of crown. It is not back and forth, it just very slowly, and once you cross the nodule, you can come. You don't have to go all the way distal. You just come backwards very slowly. So, and it's the concept of look, listen, feel. Look, because you can see it stalls and it just jumps, right? Listen, you're looking for the high cadence pitch, and feel. You can feel when it passes. 
right? And then you come backwards, you feel it's resistance and you kind of jump backwards. If you continue to feel that resistance, that means you have more atherectomy to do without having to go to high speed. Okay. Uh, sometimes uh, we'll, we'll see um, sort of uh, like a wire bias. Uh, uh, after uh, orbital atherectomy, we see this uh, sort of snowman effect, two lumens uh, on OCT after orbital atherectomy. Is it because we haven't really uh, arthrectomized uh, good enough? We should carry on with the arthrectomy or is it sometimes uh, uh, what you observe as well? With this sort of double lumen that you can see? Yeah, I, I, I've seen that before. Um, you know, our goal is not so much for debulking, it's just for plaque modification. You just want to create a little crack. There's a little bit of debulking, but it's just plaque modification. Once you multiply the plaque, you don't really have to do eight, nine passes, maybe too low and a high if it's above a, a three, five, come back and just go with nominal pressure with the balloon um, and the balloon fully dilates. And I think uh, you're ready to put the stent in. But uh, the, the, I think the risk of perforation and dissection is higher when you start to get too aggressive. Once you make a pass here and there, I think at that point, then you have the option of coming back again but if you cause a catastrophe, then all bets are off. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Let, let's move on. Our last speaker uh, will be Dr. Alan Chen. Uh, he's from Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Hong Kong. And now he's going to put everything together and talk to us about this cocktail therapy for unusual calcified lesion, uh, the road to success. Alan, please. So my, my task today is try to uh, put uh, bring everything together. So um, I have no particular conflict of interest to, uh, to disclose. So um, we, now we have uh, lots of discussion of various weapons for our calcified enemy. So in the past, we have a lots of um, scoring balloon, ultra high pressure balloon, and then various types of aphrectomy, and the latest uh, shock wave level So um, 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 uh, our, uh, our speakers have talked about most of them, particularly the aphrectomy device and the shock wave. So each of them have their strength as well as their weakness. So um, before I go to detail, so probably I need to maybe refresh a little bit about our ordinance, uh, uh, something very fundamental. So I think nowadays uh, when we are facing calcified lesion, I think um, it's almost a must if you can do it with intravascular imaging. And in this particular paper, uh, publishing new, uh, neural interventions, uh, the rule of five of OCT, the parameters, can able to um, help us to guide whether we need, need upfront uh, a potent uh, calcified modified, uh, modified techniques uh, like a fractal or shockwave. So the rule of five is simple. You have an art of more than half of the uh, uh, circumference. Uh, more than uh, 0.5 millimeters thickness, as well as along uh, more than five millimeters in length. So we need to think of uh, whether we need upfront aphrectomy uh, uh, modifications. Um, recently, uh, in the last one to two years, there are lots of uh, uh, interest in this particular areas and uh, several uh, um, papers as well as uh, review articles had uh, tried to illustrate the uh, contemporary approach of medicine calcified coronary lesions. So in, 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 in common, most of the uh, recommendation will rely heavily on, first of all, imaging and also uh, whether we can pass the lesion with balloon or imaging cavities or, uh, uh, or not. We may need to use the uh, upfront aphrectomy to, uh, with or without additional uh, calcified modified techniques, like, for example, lithotripsy balloon. So in, uh, uh, in another, in another uh, series, actually, again, uh, this imaging um, uh, information we need to assess and then whether we need to use a uh, high pressure balloon, level to see whether we can pass the, uh, pass the balloon or to use a uh, uh, rotational refractive or optical refractive for uncrossed positions. So uh, commonly, again, um, they have a crossover with uh, upfront refractive with or without subsequent uh, lethal chipsy in uh, uh, tackling really challenging calcified lesions. So um, in the European uh, counterparts, um, again, it's a very uh, busy slide and uh, complex interface, but it's essential. They also uh, rely heavily on imaging to give us extra anatomical information and subsequently various uh, calcium modification techniques. And in particular, in these uh, recommendations, uh, follow-up reassessment imaging modality need to assess whether there's adequate lesion or calcified, uh, calcium modification before, uh, before you put in a stand. 
So uh, I would like to use two cases to illustrate the principle. So this is the first case, 74 years old gentleman with all the uh, cardiovascular risk factors, present with heart failures, with impaired airway functions, nucleus scan, uh, nucleus scan showing the ischemia throughout all arteries, and coronary shows uh, left uh, a right dominant uh, right dominant systems, um, LED and RC CTO with heavily calcified lesions. So RC is also occluded, which I'm not going to show you. Uh, you can see uh, from the angiographical point of view, there is a parallel tram lines of calcification along the whole LED and uh, uh, LED. So after heart team discussion, high risk PCI was the suggestions. So we uh, bring the patient for high-risk PCI using the impeller support. And after crossing the LED seater with a XDR wire, uh, I already feel the uh, microcavities have a hard time to pass through the lesions. And uh, in use of the severe underlying calcification, uh, it should be a first, uh, 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 the OCT cannot really pass the lesion. So I don't have the baseline and uh, OCT image. But after crossing the lesion with the uh, rotational aphrectomy, I can make the track and uh, without further resistance, I take the first OCT. So this is the first OCT already after the rotation of fracting me. So um, if you um, uh, use the same principle derived from the um, OCT papers, in fact, there's still uh, a very thick calcified plug, more, uh, it's, it's particular regions more than one millimeter thick and long diffuse circumferential calcifications. So uh, I think uh, and there's not much calcified uh, um, uh, fracturing. So I need further calcified modification techniques. In, and in, in this particular case, I uh, used a uh, shockwave balloon. Uh, this is one of the, our early series of using a rotor shock approach. So after the shockwave reposition, we used the one to one balloon sizing, 2.5 in the mid-distal and then 3 -oh in the more proximal regions. So uh, you can see beautifully there's uh, um, a cracking, very deep cracking uh, over the calcified plug uh, along the uh, 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 coronary vessels. So I think uh, uh, we have a really decent calcified modification after this rotor shock approach. Of course, uh, before standing, we routinely use high pressure balloon to further blow up the vessel before putting stands. And it is the post-standing and post-dilatation result. And you may agree uh, the stand expansion opening is pretty good. Um, this uh, a lot of cracking and the luminal gain is uh, uh, very satisfactory. So we think we've been able to help the patient to, have, uh, to achieve a longer result. The so first case is the road shock approach. So subsequently, because we gain more experience, we have we, actually we are facing more calcified patients in our locality. This second case is an 82 years old gentleman uh, to get is even more complex. Uh, he have all the CV restrictors. AF, uh, first of all, present with non stemic in uh, another referring hospital. Uh, although the LV ejection fraction is satisfactory, but however, he had underlying severe aortic stenosis. Core angiogram in the referring hospital showed core, uh, left main and uh, free vessel disease. I think, judging from the angiogram, you can able to see this, this is not really the calcified coronary, but it's a calcified man. You can see the uh, 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 porcelain aortus, calcified mitral annulus together with the calcified aortic arch, uh, aortic valve. So in after heart team discussion, we bring the patient for a pre-CI uh, subsequently uh, followed by a TAFI. So uh, I would like to illustrate the uh, in principle, in particular, I would say for this case. So um, we can pass through the OCD capitals initially, and this is the OCD run. You can see but for this uh, diffuse uh, calcification, uh, some region is concentric, but more proximally is eccentric, like the calcified nodule. This is a big vessel, it's a, uh, it's a 3 5 distal and 4 -oh proximal. You can see these calcified nodules. So, for the uh, most critical uh, uh, stenotic part, MO is 1.55 millimeters square only. And there's several regions with very fat calcium. So, at the beginning, uh, we think that after we can able to pass the uh, lesion with the OCD catheters, uh, we may be able to try shockwave balloon. Uh, let's make it simple because for this CV aortic uh, stenosis case, we want to uh, keep it simple, uh, avoid uh, unnecessary affecting me for any possible slow reflow. So we put a uh, free O uh, shockwave balloon. But however, because of, again, as presented by Dr. Lam, this is the uh, the poor deliverability of the device. This is the, despite we're using an AL guide, this is the, the most uh, distal part of the balloon we can pass and uh, we cannot further at once. And we did try to open up the balloon, but you see there's a, a really uh, a limited uh, uh, success. And we did OCD after the initial fuel shock. We can only see only minimal cracking of the, of the part, and there's not much effect on the critical lesions. Uh, 
uh, without any other options, uh, we uh, pull out the orbital aphrectomy for this case. This is a big vessels, and then the three, five, and four proximal. If you're using a rotational refractive, we need to upsize the balloon. And probably, according to Sirius, uh, optical refractive will have less uh, low reflect as compared to rotational refractive. So we use a uh, slow speed uh, in the more mid to distal part and then high speed in the more mid to proximal part. And uh, uh, follow up the same principle of slow pullback, uh, one millimeter per second, and then uh, in and out push and pull. Uh, we're able to, uh, and from the visuals, auditory, and tactile feedback, we, we think we're able to, mod we already have uh, enough modification. And this is the OCT after the initial orbital aphrectomy. You can see um, this is one of the what's called snowman, um, is the... Um, for me, I think this is one of the, uh, uh, whatever you can uh, argue, this is some prop modification, uh, but from the OCD for the uh, uh, microscopic level, I think this is already um, uh, uh, a good lesion preparation already uh, from the uh, uh, OCD point of view. But again, there is still a lot of calcium surrounding most of the region, despite uh, using slow and then high speed. This is already uh, close to 1.5 million, uh, uh, mm lumen look gain over these particular snowman regions. So after that, we pull out the uh, same aerial uh, balloon shock wave and then try to give more uh, further modification. This is the pre uh, uh, orbital refractive shock wave and then this is the afterwards. So I think you agree uh, there is already further lesion modification and lesion uh, expansions. This is the uh, OCT at the beginning. After the first uh, shock wave, which is failed, after the uh, first um, uh, OAS, some uh, lesional gain, and then finally uh, uh, followed by the uh, final lithotripsy. You can see we uh, modify the plant, we abrade some of the uh, fake uh, regions, and then further crack the lesion. And after seeing this beautiful image, we are pretty sure and very relieved uh, to go ahead for stenting. And this is the post stenting and post post dilatation result. So ladies and gentlemen, I think intravascular imaging, in particular OCD in this uh, era, can help for us help us to assess and guide treatment strategy for really calcified coronary lesions. And there's various treatment algorithms available to optimize our approach in calcified coronary lesions. Uh, I think it's particularly important for us to visualize uh, calcium fracturing before you put in a stand, just like uh, some of the cases illustrated by the previous speakers. So cocktail or combination therapy may be required to treat these super calcified lesions uh, in the coming future. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alan. That's a terrific case. Can, can you just briefly tell us uh, how are you going to decide whether to go for a rotational or orbital arthrectomy if you cannot cross the lesion? Yes. Uh, I think um, uh, some of the speakers uh, have that present before have already mentioned some of the key points. So um, traditionally, for really uh, uh, tight lesion, we may uh, use uh, rotational refractive because uh, um, uh, uh, for critical tight, even I can't pass the uh, OCD cavities or imaging cavities, probably I may try to use rotational refractive. Um, of course, uh, uh, you may try uh, orbital, but uh, sometimes. Um, uh, for really critical type, probably you have, have a uh, issue whether you can, can't, may not really can't able to cross the lesions. Of course, yeah, if you're patient enough and then uh, keep on uh, uh, prepare the lesion in upfront, then you may be able to cross up it. But still, for me, um, uh, a little bit worry. Maybe um, the expert um, the doctor. Uh, doesn't he may able to come in their orbital experience for really critical uncrossable lesions with the orbital. Um, but for me, I think probably uh, upfront, uh, uncrossed solution, probably I will try to use optical, uh, a rotational effective me. I think it will still work, right, Michael? Yeah, so with oral atherectomy, the first contact with the device to the calcium is actually not going to have diamond uh, crusts or diamond burrs on it. So you're not going to really have the ability to ablate. With rotational atherectomy, where you're hitting the device with the calcium, you have the diamond particles. So that's potential benefit. But the concern will be if you cross, then you can't cross back. And there's some reports, and that could be a very... But uh, we actually published our series. Um, the, cr the success rate for crossing was over 98%. Um, so I think with some persistence, uh, in my experience, I've never been not able to cross. It's always crossed, uh, but there are reports. So uh, it's it's all with comfort level. Um, one thing I think about the orbital atherectomy is that the viper wire is somewhat more supportive 
if you have a very tight stenosis, uh, maybe not doing it a rotor floppy wire with rotation atherectomy. I've seen case reports where the wire fractures. So maybe you want to use a stiffer wire with, with such cases, but uh, the Viper wire is a very supportive wire and actually gives you good, good support. Great. So uh, just, uh, any other sorry. Short comments? Yes, Leva, short comments. Yes, just follow uh, Dr. Lee, uh, I mean, uh, description. So in case of very tight lesion not causable by rotational arthrectomy, you're usually using a, a packing movement to pack the rotor. But for, for operative arthrectomy, we aim at very slow movement. So if can't really cause and seldom we suggest for packing for mm. OAS. So, but I worry that if we keep on, I mean, uh, uh, passing, I mean, pushing the, the crown across, but we can't cause, we keep on upgrading the site, which is not very classified. <laughs> Maybe the risk that we will, I mean, uh, cause, I mean, uh, perforation or the, or the more possible part before causing the lesion. So what is your tips and tricks in, in case really hard lesion you do use? really slow upgraded or you, you have some other other movement other other tricks for that it's still just kind of gentle pushing it doesn't go pull back gentle push it's kind of like uh, advancing a stent you know when your stent doesn't go what you do is pull back the wire with your left hand and that sucks the guide and advance uh the stent forward same thing i just um gently go forward and if it starts to feel like the velocity starts coming down then pull back then allow the velocity to go back up to 80,000 RPMs, gently go forward, and you can start here the stall of the device, then pull back. So it's also just a listening, uh, feeling, and just with gentle pressure. And you know, this is sometimes your heart rate starts to go very fast because you, you wonder about you're gonna perforate, but just persistence does help. Um, you know, sometimes actually one little trick I did have, when it didn't cross, I actually went on glad assist. It only rotates 5,000 RPM, but it's not orbiting, right? So it's not making a big loop. So it actually just crossed right through. So consider using uh, glide assist at 5,000 RPM. Mm. That's a uh, good trick. Yes, thank you. I, I would like to highlight one okay. point in Adam's case. Oh, I think the sequence on the use of the uh, tools is also important. After short waves, sometimes there will be lots of dissection. I think Adam's case is very good. You have used OCT to demonstrate that not much dissection, then you go for the diamond back CSI. If there's many dissection, I think I have to warn the audience, um, after the short wave, don't use the diamond back. It could be dangerous. Yes. Okay. That's why um, I keep, you. yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, I think we need to wrap up. So uh, thank you very much, uh, the panelist, my co-chair, two overseas speakers, uh, Michael Lee and Dr. Kashima. Uh, I think we have a very good discussion on the use of rotor blader and then IVL and then uh, orbital arthrectomy and then a combination of all these devices to treat our forever enemy, the calcified lesions. Uh, hope you all enjoy the session and uh, wish you a good day and a good night for you. Properly. Okay, Thank take so much, care. And I hope to see you soon. Stay safe. Okay. Hope okay. to see you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you, everyone. Bye -bye.